a treat to have with us the head of WhatsApp, Will Cathcart. Hi, Chris. Thank you so much for having me um, and for giving me the chance to, to have this conversation. You know, I'm struck um, by the fact that this conversation had to be digital. Uh, you know, we, we, because of coronavirus, haven't been able to get together face to face for TED or really almost anything else. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, you and I have had a number of conversations in the lead up to today, and they've all had to be digital. We've never actually met face to face, even though it feels like we have. Um, and we at WhatsApp, you know, work on a product and a technology to try to help people have face to face conversations when they can't be face to face. And we've seen in the last few months that be more necessary than ever. Um, and people turn to WhatsApp even more than they had before, as you mentioned, in places like Afghanistan and all around the world, to be able to talk, to connect with a loved one, um, or do even more, as you mentioned, you know, more sensitive things. For governments to conduct work or discussions with the people in the country, um, for businesses to get work done, for doctors to connect with patients. We've seen doctors, for example, in Northern Italy use WhatsApp as a way to connect with patients when they couldn't be physically together. Um, and you, you, you put it perfectly, we believe this works because people trust WhatsApp. They trust that they can have a deeply sensitive private conversation when they can't be sitting face to face with the same level of security and privacy they would have had in the real world digitally on WhatsApp. And the reason why, as you mentioned, is a technology we use called end-to-end -end encryption, which many of you watching the talk will be familiar with, but for those who aren't, end-to-end -end encryption is a, it's a pretty special technology because what it lets you do is send a message to someone or make a call to someone and know that they're the only one who will get it. So for example, Chris, you could send a message to your doctor and know that as soon as it leaves your phone, it's scrambled. No one can see it along the way, not even WhatsApp until it reaches your doctor and then they can see it. And there've been a, a number of questions and discussions around this recently, as you mentioned. Um, even in fact, in liberal democracies, there's increasingly been a question as to whether that kind of technology should be something you as a person have access to, to use, or whether we need to change to a model where if you're calling someone, messaging someone, video chatting with someone, there has to be a, a central repository of that. Some company or government have a way to go access what you're saying. We think this is a pretty serious choice with meaningful consequences for people as we build back. You know, COVID accelerated a trend where we were increasingly communicating digitally instead of face-to-face -face already. And now as we enter a world where at times we're gonna have to communicate digitally, um, and even when we don't have to, increasingly we will, to not have the ability to do that securely, knowing that no one can listen to your conversation, we think would be a huge issue. You'd have to worry about hackers and criminals accessing your conversations or even governments and foreign governments eavesdropping on what you're doing. And more broadly, if we wanna live in a world where governments can use it to communicate, doctors can talk to patients, educators can talk to students, and you can talk to the people closest in your life about the most sensitive things. We think we need to have end-to-end -end encryption and products like WhatsApp that are secure so you know those conversations are safe. Well, the, the scale of WhatsApp is, is astonishing. I, I, I think you have like 2 billion active users and is it 100 billion messages per day? 100 billion messages per day. I can't get my head around it. Um, give, us, give us a story of how encrypted communication has really led to something positive so that we can just get the feel of it in action. Yeah, I mean, a, you know, a great example of this is the ability for a government to communicate when you can't be together. So we, you know, we saw stories with coronavirus of the British military reaching out to members of the military with orders and instructions on where they needed to be um, over WhatsApp. Of course, we hear about that in the news because we have no way of knowing, we have no way of seeing. Um, and more broadly, you know, obviously not everyone's a government official or working in government, but if you think about your life, and what you do in a typical day. And a lot of the countries where WhatsApp is popular, people use it 
not just to talk to their loved ones, but to conduct business. You use it to communicate with shopkeepers, small businesses in particular, to order food, to order clothes, um, to book services. And knowing that you can do that and share all the information you share as part of a, you know, economic transaction, actually, I think is enabled because you know that it's secure. You know that no one's looking at what you're saying. I mean, delivering trustable privacy to people is clearly a, an important good. Uh, but some people worry about the, you know, that it carries with it an inherent. Is it an inherent danger that people can use that security to, for example, share dangerous messages or, or even transmit truly obnoxious material like in its most extreme, like child pornography. How, is that just a trade-off that uh, society has to make? It's one thing versus the other. Can you, can you adjust the balance so that you can kind of minimize the risks while still giving the security? Yeah, we believe that you, you can give security and take steps to combat bad abuse. Uh, we do that every day. In fact, we lead the industry on foreign encrypted messaging service, being able to find and detect abuse in general. And as you mentioned, people sharing inappropriate uh, illegal imagery about children. Um, we find and detect thousands of accounts uh, and, and report them each month based on things like someone in the conversation seeing something and feeling uncomfortable and choosing to report it to us, at which point we can see, or patterns of behavior. Um, but what we, what we don't have is every message sent by over 2 billion people. And we believe that fundamentally the security trade-off, the, the cost to your safety for us to start collecting every one of those messages would be disastrous and you don't want us to. And this feels new and, and unfamiliar because it's new to us as a society to have digital conversations, but it's not new to us as a society to have conversations. We've done it for thousands of years with an expectation that when you say something to someone else, Chris, as soon as the words leave your mouth, they're gone. Um, mm. And we've chosen, even though we could as a society, not to do all sorts of things you could do to fight crime. You know, we at this point could build a camera and a microphone and install it in every living room in the United States, uh, hooked up to a central server for the government to access it. But I think naturally we would recoil in horror at the consequences of doing something like that, even if there would be some cases where it would help solve crimes. And mm. our view is that if we're gonna be forced to have conversations digitally because we can't be sitting face to face, we shouldn't have to give up the security and privacy we've had for hundreds of years in that transition. My last question before community questions. Uh, coronavirus, <laughs> suddenly everyone's in lockdown. It's made a huge difference to your business. Give us, give us some numbers and descriptions of how it's changed behavior. Yeah. I mean. For us, what we've seen is more people sending messages. You mentioned over 100 billion messages a day uh, in April. Uh, in particular, we've seen a lot of people doing video calls um, to connect with people, especially group video calls. We actually um, expanded the limit so you can call up to eight people now in WhatsApp. And we've seen a lot of governments and health agencies use it to get information out to people. So helplines in over 70 countries and agencies where you can get information. But the, the, you know, the stories that stick with us the most are where people are doing things that um, they just couldn't do before. You know, for me, the idea that doctors are using it to communicate with patients is fantastic. I mean, the idea that you don't have to go into a doctor's office or a hospital to get help is unbelievable. The idea that governments uh, are using it. We've heard stories of governments in both India and Brazil where WhatsApp is possible, where the court systems using WhatsApp to communicate about cases because you don't want to bring everyone into a courtroom. Mm. All right, take community, your questions. <clears throat> how do you balance privacy and the risk in the spread of misinformation? Um, this is a great question. We, th we think about this a lot. And the way we've dealt with misinformation is predominantly by changing the product to recognize the fact that it is private and it is secure. And so it shouldn't be a place where you can broadcast information. So for example, um, a little over a year ago, we changed WhatsApp so that you can't forward a message to more than five people at once. If you see something, you can't spread it along. Actually, in the last few months, uh, just as coronavirus was uh, expanding around the world, we launched a feature where now if a specific message has been forwarded many times, you can only forward it to one person 
at a time and there's no quick forward button. Um, we've also partnered mm. with uh, journalism uh, fact-checking organizations so that people who want to in WhatsApp, when they see a message, can send it off to a journalist for fact-checking, which helps them uh, find out whether it's true or not. Obviously, not everyone's going to use it, but what we're really excited about is it means that even though we can't see what messages are going around, journalists can. They can get a sample of what types of people saying in their country and use that to correct misinformation in mass media. Mm. It's interesting. You can't see the information itself, but you can see what misinformation might look like at a, at a meta level and then maybe do something. And, you know, go out, go out and with, a, with a message to everyone in the country about, you know, here's the facts about coronavirus. Mm. Our next question, assuming we have one. So this is from Jacqueline Ashby. What's the current status and involvement of WhatsApp in, F in uh, Facebook's cryptocurrency Libra project? Yeah, I can't speak to all the work Libra and the Libra team are doing, but I know they're having a number of conversations with regulators about how do you build a cryptocurrency product in a way that's safe and secure and uh, resistant to all the types of harms you might see in other cryptocurrency projects. We're excited about it on WhatsApp because of the economic opportunity. You know, we have a lot of people who use WhatsApp who are um, international immigrants and working in a country far from their home who want to send money back to the people uh, that they care about at home. And today that's so expensive. And just as WhatsApp mm -hmm. made calling your family when you're overseas free, we would love to make it much, much cheaper for you to send money home. Now, the context of this question is Facebook obviously owns WhatsApp. How is that relationship, by the way, Will? Do you feel, is that a healthy relationship? Are you allowed to do your work without having to constantly somehow lean towards Facebook's bottom line in some way? <clears throat> yeah, great question. I think it's been a, fant a fantastic relationship because since WhatsApp joined Facebook over five years ago, Facebook has been able to invest in bringing to WhatsApp to everyone around the world for free. You know, it's easy for, especially those of us in the United States, us to forget this, but calling and texting people used to be atrociously expensive all around the world. Um, even in the US it cost, but in a lot of developing countries around the world, you would be talking tens of cents or more for every single text you sent, you know, large amounts of money for a 10, 20 minute phone call. WhatsApp made that all free. And by becoming part of Facebook, Facebook was able to uh, take away, actually WhatsApp used to charge users a dollar to use the service. Facebook took that away, invested in expanding it and invested in the infrastructure so we could offer not just texting, but things like voice and video calling for free worldwide. So this is possibly really puzzling to people. It certainly was to me. You told me that even like five years after Facebook acquired you, you still don't actually make money. How can that be? Yeah, we, 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 don't, we don't generate a ton of revenue. Um, we aspire to. It's not that we don't think there's interesting business opportunities with WhatsApp. We think there are. But uh, we think connecting everyone so they can have free communication is step one. And step two is connecting people with businesses. And we're already starting to see in a lot of the countries where WhatsApp is popular, people communicate with businesses for free to find out about products, buy things, book services. Um, we have millions and millions of businesses using, for example, our WhatsApp business app. And we believe that down the line, there'll be obviously great opportunities we can, we can add for those businesses that will generate revenue. For example, we hear from tons of businesses that they want to reach more customers. We can help businesses that have never advertised before advertise on Instagram or Facebook for the first time and find more customers, which would be great for economic activity. But the focus for us has been, how do you reach people all around the world? How do you get them connected? How do you get the businesses connected? And down the line, the opportunities will come. We'll take uh, two more community questions. What do you think will be the transformational and longer term impact of COVID-19 on technology use in our daily lives? Are we all getting confused between the real world and the virtual world now? Is this, is this gonna take over and be our lives in the future? So it's a great question, Anna. Yeah, it's a great question, Anna. I mean, I think to some extent, we're going to find that things we thought you had to do face to face, you can do digitally. Um, and we will adapt to think of those as similar to what we did face to face, even if that sounds hard to believe. You know, I, I, my wife and I have a daughter, she's almost two years old. And we had this funny realization after we, she was born that we didn't agree on how to pronounce her name. 
I say Naomi and my wife says Naomi. And as parents, that's like the worst thing you can do um, is disagree on how to pronounce your daughter's name. And it took us a couple months to figure out how that happened uh, before we realized the answer was that every conversation we'd had about naming our daughter had been typed. It hadn't actually been in person face to face, but we didn't know that as, as people, we just think of those conversations the same. And so I think part of the transformation from COVID-19 is we're going to, we're going to communicate remotely. People are going to work remotely. They're going to do a lot more of this digitally. And to them, it won't feel any different or as different as you might think as when they were sitting next to each other. Last question. I know we have another one. Well, while we're waiting for that, I'm, I'm going to ask you this. Just, just you know, th hearing President Ghani talk about the power of these face-to-face -face conversations, humans to humans in a, in a circle, like, do you th is there a fundamental difference between the way that humans communicate when they're texting each other versus when they're, they're speaking? And do you think, like, is there a correction almost that could happen in the world now as, as companies like yours and others start building more video communication as opposed to just text, 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 that it might change this cycle of outrage, if you like, that um, text-based social media seems to have driven? Yeah, great question. I mean, for us, look, we, I personally, you know, my, my preference would have been to have this conversation in person. You know, my preference would have been for us to be all together in Vancouver um, to talk, because I do think there are parts of a face-to-face -face conversation that technology doesn't just capture. Um, I think the challenge for us as people who build technological products is how do we get closer to that? How do we make it so that if you're having a conversation with someone and you have to be separated by thousands of miles or you have to be separated by six feet, how do we make it so that uh, it feels as close to face-to-face? -to -face? Video helps with that. You know, even are there improvements you can make to that to make it feel more emotive? Are there improvements you can make to it so it's really truly as secure and private um, as you would have had with a face-to-face -face conversation? You know, are there ways you can make it so that if I text you something, it doesn't feel like that's going to hang around forever? Um, I think that's the challenge for us. And part of why we believe with WhatsApp, it's so important that we match the security and privacy you have in person digitally and not say, hey, this digital world is totally different. We should change all the ways human beings communicate and completely upend the rules. No, we should try to match that as best we can because there's something magical about people talking to each other privately. Hmm. Well, well, I think we're out of time. Um, th thank you for, I mean, it really is an amazing company. Thank you for many lovely pictures and videos I get pretty much every day for my grandkids. Couldn't happen without WhatsApp in quite the same way, I don't think. Um, and, um, you know, you're at the middle of an incredibly important debate about how humans use these tools to build the future. So thank you for sharing. If someone wants to reach out to WhatsApp and they have a suggestion or a question, how, how can they best reach out to you? They can come up, come on our website, whatsapp.com and we have options for how you can reach out and, um, or, you know, uh, you know, find us on Twitter uh, at WhatsApp and let us know what you think. Thank you so much, Chris, for the chance to, to talk. We think this is a really important no, issue and, and one we hope others are paying attention to. All right. Thank you. All best, Will. Take care. Thank you.